of extremist activity in Saddam Hussein's hometown. Tonight, we take you back to the Sunni Triangle, one of the most dangerous spots in Iraq. Our special report on the road in Iraq continues tonight. Here's AFN correspondent Michelle Michael. Michael, we continue our special coverage tonight from inside the Sunni Triangle. I'm at forward operating base Danger in Tikrit. First Infantry Division soldiers here are working with civil and military authorities in Iraq to build a secure, stable, and self-reliant country. Part of that process is to neutralize anti-coalition insurgents. First ID soldiers raid this hotel in Tikrit. They're looking for anything out of the ordinary. Specialist Kenneth Siegel. Looking for weapons. Weapons like those insurgents could use against U.S. and coalition forces, both here in Tikrit and throughout the rest of Iraq. Every family's lauded one AK and one magazine, so if they have more than that, then we confiscate it. He started off the conversation with, it's my stuff. There's sometimes we do it during broad daylight, and sometimes we do it at night. U.S. troops say not only do they look for weapons, but for the people who made those weapons. We've got some key people. Those key captures mean fewer insurgents on the streets. The goal is to eventually rid the area of the remnants of the Saddam regime. Samara. As one soldier tosses this photo of Saddam aside, he hopes Iraqis unsure of the U.S. will eventually mirror his actions. It's the local Iraqis who often supply First ID soldiers with the information they need for those raids. Every day, troops leave this military camp. They go out into these villages, build relationships with the people, and improve the Iraqi way of life. It's a life that is drastically different than what it was under the Saddam regime. Sergeant Kimberly Lewis follows the 1st Infantry Division into Tikrit. After the fall of Baghdad, certain tribes in Iraq were forced out of their homes and displaced because of looting and robbery due to the instability within the country during the war. The Kurdish came and they forced us to leave. We, when we left by force, all we have is our clothes and our bag, nothing else. And we really don't need anything. Except for the land and lifestyle they're used to. First of all, what we need from the American force to be always in safe. We need this school to be fixed. We need to have water, electricity. That's all we ask. The school is the first hurdle First ID decided to tackle. All because Sheikh Sergi Gaid and his tribe members are... He's abiding by the laws and he's been very friendly to us at every opportunity. He's been very, very patient. Uh, especially considering his circumstances and the uncertainty of what's befalling him and his people. First ID took in the sheikh and his people who are presently living on an abandoned military compound. He said we don't have anything hope except like we'll be on this land and set it on. And that would be school for the children, so maybe the kids will have a better future than they have. Sheikh Gaid is doing is he's trying to find out what the future holds for his tribe, as well as uh, the people that he's kind of left along the way. What the future holds for Sheikh Gaid and his tribe, no one knows. But for now, eligible tribe members are enlisted in the Iraqi National Guard, sending the paychecks back home to work on a better way of life. Sergeant Kimberly Lewis, AFN News, to Crete. The Big Red One's role here in Iraq is quite large. In an exclusive interview, we sat down with the commander of 1ID, Major General John Batiste, to talk about where the country is now and the challenges of securing Iraq in the future. We're, we're here to do many things, but uh, not the least of which is to conduct full-spectrum operations. By that I mean we're here to kill or capture the anti-Iraqi forces, the terrorists, the foreign fighters, uh, the criminal element, the former regime elements. There's a lot of progress. You look around Tikrit or Bakuba, uh, or Beji, or Samarra, or Balad, any number of cities in AO danger, uh, things are happening. We've got irreversible momentum going in the right direction. And it all really does start with competent Iraqi security forces. The Iraqi National Guard with us today, the police, and the Department of Border Enforcement. At the moment, we're worried about vehicle-borne IEDs and IEDs along the highways. The enemy tends to use the kinds of weapons that they can stand off from and not engage us in a, in a direct fight. We control the roads. We control the ground. That, that's the biggest thing. And we do it with multiple forms of contact, both on the ground, in the air, uh, by spheres of influence engagements, 
by observation posts at the right place with a sniper rifle uh, to kill or capture the enemy who might want to emplace an IED along any of our roads. I think the biggest challenge today is the resettlement. That is, the, the thousands of Kurds and Arabs and Turkmen and Assyrian that were displaced during Saddam Hussein's regime. So now we're working through the deliberate process at local uh, governmental control areas uh, to make sure we do this safely and do it deliberately, impartially, and transparently. I think the soldiers of the 1st Infantry Division know well the impact they're having. Every one of these soldiers is contributing to this irreversible momentum. This country's heading in the right direction, and quite frankly, it doesn't matter what the enemy wants at this point. There's going to be freedom and some form of Iraqi democracy in Iraq. The new Iraqi government is only a couple of months old, and so is the know-how to protect it. Specialist Amy English shows us how One ID is training the Iraqi National Guard to defend its country. These Iraqi guardsmen commit themselves to defend their young democracy. We want to make the country safe. We want to live in peace and make it so there's no difference between Muslim, Christian, Sunni, and Shiite. Because of today's threat of explosives in this part of Iraq, these trainees are learning to conduct a traffic checkpoint. They have to check the vehicle completely underneath it. We need to provide security. They'll usually have four guards that will provide security on the personnel and check the vehicle to make sure there's nothing in there that's illegal. Iraqis hope these checkpoints will prevent car bombs and other threats to the stability of their new government. My job here is to serve the core, to serve the people, and keep the city clear from weapons. After only four weeks of training, the new soldiers take their skills to the streets. You see them develop, and by the time they finish here, they're all motivated and ready to go and get on with their business. It's more their business every day, as the U.S. role decreases and the Iraqi military becomes more self-sufficient. Specialist Amy English. Yes, yes. Bye. AFN News. Bye. To Crete. The new Iraqi elections are slated for January, and already the U.S. has started to scale back its role here in Iraq. Lieutenant Colonel Ellis Brockman says one of the challenges that may come with the new democracy is getting people out to the polls despite their fears of insurgents. I think the biggest concern is that we feel that uh, from those anti Iraqi forces' perspective, we feel that uh, those guys may try and do something to uh, sway voters to particularly maybe not go to the polls or things of that nature. We let people know that uh, they should get out and go and vote, not be subjective to what the uh, anti-Iraqi forces are trying to do. The Iraqis will be in charge of keeping order during the election, but the U.S. military says soldiers will be on standby to help out if needed. Well, from the election in Iraq to the race for the White House, First ID soldiers are casting their votes for the presidency. Sergeant Damien Steptor has more. Well, put the parish name here. Uh, parish name there. It's as easy as filling out a form and dropping it in the mail. Consider our mission over here and, and trying to, to provide the, the Iraqi people the same opportunities and the same way of life that we have uh, back in the United States. So, uh, we place a lot, a lot of emphasis on the, the voting process. According to voting assistance officers, the voting process from here in Iraq is actually quite simple. DOD level on down, there's a, a huge emphasis on the, on the voting assistance uh, program this year. And again, we were provided the, the, all the materials that we needed, provided all the information. Uh, they made it very easy for us to make sure that our soldiers had the opportunity to, to register to vote. To register, you send off an application and request for an absentee ballot. Leaders from the 1st Infantry Division began their voting campaign back in April. They assigned voting assistance officers to each unit and made sure 100% of the soldiers were contacted. For one soldier, he says the Army's voting drive provides an added boost to morale. It's very comforting to know that my unit is concerned about um, the same views that I have with America and um, that they're encouraging soldiers to vote. Smith says his vote matters even when he's thousands of miles from home. Sergeant Damien Steptour, AFN News, Tikrit.
And finally tonight, the drab and dusty colors of war can take an emotional toll on U.S. soldiers. But take a look at this. Soldiers are brushing all of that away and leaving behind a brighter side of the U.S. role here. These 12-foot concrete barriers are designed to protect the troops from mortar attacks at forward operating base War Horse in Bakuba. Some of the art, like this chapel, is far from camouflaged with the rest of the structures on the camp. But soldiers say this art of war is good for troop morale. More colors splash the walls of War Horse with every day that passes. Thanks so much for watching this special report inside the Sunni Triangle. Before we leave you, some troops want to say hello from the front lines. My wife, Kira, in Kotterbach, Germany. I love you, sweetheart. I miss you. I'll be home soon. I'd like to say hi to my wife, Shanita, and my two girls, Ashley and Candy. I'd like to say hi to my wife, Pam, my children, Mitchell, Tori, and Stephen. I'd like to say hi to my wife, Amber, and my kids, Joshua, Dustin, Dan, and Juliet. We're in Wurzburg, Germany. And to all the children in Kotterbach, Germany, welcome back to school. Have a great school week.